on your mobile device. Uh, over the last two weeks, we've been talking about Israel and the church. Uh, we all know there's a lot going on overseas. There's a lot going on in what would be called the Middle East, but there's a lot going on globally. And so today we're wrapping that series up. It's a different graphic because I want to bring an emphasis. We are going to talk about Israel and end times, but the graphic is a sharp turn ahead. I know most of you in here would say, I understand that one day Jesus will return. How many would just say amen or shout that out? Uh, it's either then or when you leave, you ex you, your life ends here, you're going to have a sharp turn in your uh, road. I, I, some of you, this is the positive side of the sharp turn. Those are the people who have Jesus. And then there's another turn that's the other direction, just giving you a little graphics there. But I want to talk today about... Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, I've got f probably 60, 70, 80 hours worth of research. Uh, I, it's been informative to me. I've learned so much. No, you're not going to need to stay here for 60 or 70 hours. But, uh, but I'm going to try to wrap up today the mountain peaks. What I would say is through this, make sure and read the Word of God. As we look at the th signs of the times, if you look at the things, not only that are happening uh, in the seasons of 2023, but however long until, uh, as we tarry until Jesus returns, please don't just educate yourself on social media. Please don't rely on the news outlets as your only place of getting a footing of where you stand. We as believers believe in this book, it's still relevant today. And I just want to encourage you, encourage you, and encourage you not to lose sight of that. And so today what is part of this is I want to bring what is going on using some of the things going on in Israel or the Middle East of how God's redemptive plan is still happening. God's redemptive plan. It's a plan that began at the beginning of time, and he saw all the way to the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. So today I'm going to do a little review over the last couple of weeks. We're going to look at what Jesus uh, says about the future when he was asked, and then we're going to uh, talk briefly about what the Christians or, or the church can do. Kind of going back to week one and some of the past two weeks, we're going to talk about Abram and Sarai, or Abraham and Sarah, as it becomes in Genesis chapter 12. There was this man, and his name was Abram. He comes from a pagan father, a pagan family. Uh, in Joshua, the book of Joshua, it says that he, God chose him, pursues him, predestines him, elects him, uh, calls him, saves him. Basically says, I want you to leave your mother and father. I want you to leave all that you know as an act of faith. And I want you to go to a land, everybody say land, because this is a big thing right now, uh, that I will show you. And we can move to Genesis chapter 15. We see that God appears to him again. He makes a series of promises to him that the theologians eventually would call the Abrianic Covenant. Uh, this covenant we found is unconditional, which means it's not a contract. If man does this, if Israel does this, no, it's God saying, I make these promises. It's my covenant with you. So no matter how you behave, no how many, however many times you fall away from the Lord, I have made some promises to you. Folks, that is still true today. To the church today, to believers today, whatever this word says as a promise is still relevant because he's the same God today, isn't he? He'll be the same God tomorrow. In this covenant, uh, we find three aspects, okay? We find land, lineage, and the Lord. I'm going to kind of uh, look at each of these pieces today. God promised or a specific land to the descendants of Abraham. He also, uh, we know that through this promised land, uh, it would be passed on to, through the lineage of Abraham. And then we know that through his descendants, God, which is the Jews and the Israelites, that through that, there would be a blessing of the Lord. Through this, this um, coming uh, that, uh, that will bring uh, peace to all the world, who will set all captives free, who will be the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, who will come and set up a second kingdom. His name is Jesus Christ. I don't know if you knew that or not. I know you're so the coming of Christ, the fulfillment of all Jewish prophecy, and the fulfillment of the uh, entire Jewish system as they've known it comes through this covenant. I believe at the moment that that covenant, the, the moment that God spoke that covenant to Abraham, made those promises, I believe there was a spiritual war over that land. I believe it began then and it continues to stay even today. If we remember some things, um, 
We remember that uh, every time God is creating something, Satan is counterfeiting something. Have you, have you noticed that throughout Scripture? So I want us to look at this, that as we look at the spiritual war or warfare that's raging over the land, it's more than what we see in the physical. There's something in a, in a greater perspective. Who's going to take the land, the lineage? Who, who's going to be destroyed? Who's going to receive the blessing? And really what's at stake here is who is really the Lord? What is the true God? This, the land is spoken about in the Old Testament uh, over, uh, meaning the promised land, over 2,000 times. In the New Testament, over 700 times. This land is crucial to the political history, but it's also a prophetic history that we can learn from. Moving into Genesis chapter 16, Abram and Sarah struggled to believe God's promises. And God told him, hey, you're going to have a son, and he will be your lineage, and through him will come uh, the Lord, a blessing to all nations through that single seed, it says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, the single seed of Abraham, the individual's name is Jesus Christ. This is all prophetic. So Sarah and Abram waited for years and years, and then they, Sarah got a little impatient. Has anybody in here ever gotten a little impatient on waiting up on the Lord? Yeah. She was losing her faith, and so she comes up with a plan and where Abram is going to take a, a second wife to have a son. Can I just make, just note this in the margin? Don't help God. <laughs> He's got it. You do not have to go, well, I'm sorry, you must have lost track of the time. I'll help you. You know, it always messes things up. Just know that. All right. So Abram takes Hagar, an Egyptian unbeliever. Okay, the, a, 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 a nation that was full of darkness and many, many gods brings him in, has a son. That son's name is Ishmael. In Genesis chapter 16, verse 12, it says this. It's a prophecy, I believe, as God, as we read it, is that this Ishmael is going to be, what? He should be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone. And doesn't leave very many people out. And everyone's hand against him, and he shall, what? Dwell over against all of his kinsmen. Ishmael has 12 sons, just like Israel had 12 tribes or sons and tribes. Eventually, God fulfills his prophetic promise to Sarah. I think we said last year, 12 to 13 years later, through a son named Isaac. So here you have this situation. You have Abraham. He has two wives. Bless his heart. He has two sons and one covenant. What is he going to do? Who gets the land? Who's going to receive the blessing? And so this conflict, even between the wives, as you read scripture, you'll find. And inevitably, God chooses Isaac, the son of Sarah, to fulfill and to receive the full promises of the Abrahamic covenant. God rejects Ishmael and Hagar. Basically, God chooses a plan of faith, a plan of, maybe you could say light, a plan of hope, a plan of promise. And the other plan, you would say, probably is a carnal plan made up by man. God goes with both of them. And, and let, me, let me push pause. I, I want you, I said this another week, is I am not trying to convince you to stand one way or the other politically. Uh, who are you supposed to stand? I, I want you to get into the Word of God. I want to bring facts to you. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to train and teach you to resolve your footing, okay? Is that, don't let a single preacher, like I say, or news, you decide to get into this word and let God teach you, okay? And so today I'm not trying to persuade you beyond what I think is the truth out of the word of God, but you need the Holy Spirit to validate that, okay? Genesis chapter 22, interesting thing happens. Abraham is about to sacrifice his son, the son of promise, that son of the miracle we're talking about, his firstborn, and we're talking about Isaac. Uh, Isaac's told to carry wood on his back so he's not a little lad, he's probably a teen or, or older, to carry it up onto a mountain, the mountain of God, and he would willingly, Isaac willingly lay himself down as a sacrifice. You know, this, this is a prophecy. This is a foreshadowing of, of Jesus, Son of God, coming to earth. He would carry the wooden cross on his back. He would willingly lay his life down and to be put to death by his father. Those are, those are things we can see. And so here's Isaac. He's, he's laying down. He's surrendering. Later, the temple is built in that same region. Later, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to that same region. region and then he 
came. This is Isaac. He carried that wood. 2,000 years later, though, here's the interesting, and I'm going through that. You've, you, that's like week one, week two. We're almost done. Isn't that great? Should have just come to this service. No, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. 2,000 years later, a man named Muhammad received a revelation from an angel. That's what he said. I actually believe it's a demonic spirit, and I'm going to explain that in just a minute. I believe, he, he, he said, in fact, if you read in Galatians, it says, even if an angel from heaven should appear and present a gospel other than the one that is presented by the apostle Paul, then they are to be cursed. So I believe this is a demonic spirit. I believe it's a counterfeit. You remember what's going on? Everything God creates, Satan does a counterfeit for. Muhammad is visited by this counterfeit spirit, and he calls it an angel. I think it's a fallen angel, Right? or a demon. And this angel demon says uh, he needs to begin prophesying and present to the world a new religion. Basically, the essence of Islam, is to, which comes out of Muhammad, is that the Hebrew scripture is wrong, that the son of promise is actually Ishmael, not Isaac. And they would say that that's our land and, and, and that should be our lineage and, and we're to worship our Lord, not Jesus, but Allah. That's what, that's what it's kind of the, 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 the distraction goes forward. And there's, so I believe there's been a war, a constant war over three things since then and that's who owns the land, whose lineage is going to inherit the covenant, and who ultimately is God. But there's actually a real war going on and this is, this is important. I believe insight, at least it was for me. The real war we can find, we've seen this, read this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, that this spiritual battle that continues until the Lord's return is not pol just political. It's not just, it's actually biblical. It's actually profoundly spiritual. And that is for we, what? We do not fight against flesh and blood. That the real war going over there, yes, there's, there's carnage and my heart breaks for all who lose their life over, but it, there's a bigger picture going on. It's going to play out until he returns. But against evil rulers and authorities of unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. We, 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 we see this, we know this, but it's hard sometimes. We separate and we look at mankind and get disappointed and we take sides and we just need to make sure we're battling the right battle. Israel's attacked on October the 7th. Hamas invades. Hamas is, they are Palestinians, but they're radicals, they're terrorists. They're, they're the one, in meaning not all Palestinians are necessarily terrorists, and they're definitely not all evil, but here, this battle's been going on for over 4,000 years because of this war between uh, Israel and or should I say Isaac and Ishmael's kids. They attacked the promised land and it was, uh, it was about, a, I believe, a spiritual war of who God is, who is he really. It occurred, interesting enough, on the, their Sabbath. It's Saturday. They were finishing a week-long Jewish holiday. I know some people, some of the news say, well, they're just having a Woodstock you know, kind of moment, these kids that were out there. No, they, th this is a celebration. We just don't know how to party like they do, pardon me. But they were finishing this, this week-long Jewish holiday, holiday called the Sukkot, and it's the one where families and friends and communities get together. It's the most joyful festival in Jerusalem. Why? They're celebrating the 40 years the Jews spent in the desert, but that's not what they're celebrating. They're saying the escape from slavery. They're set free. They're, they're talking about freedom. And then there was a terrorist attack where full-grown men did despicable, evil things to civilians, to women, to children, and to the elderly. And they would shout, oh, Allah Akbar. Somebody said, what's that all about? Well, it really translates to God is great. We might say, well, okay. But I believe these terrorists would probably say, my, their, their Arabic translation or phrase is, our God is better. Our God's better than God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and he's better than Jesus Christ. I added these things. This is not in the Bible. I'm applying them. So you hear our God is greater. You, you, you sense that there's an evil spirit against the whole history that we base Christendom on. And I believe that's a declaration of spiritual warfare, if nothing else. 
See, the last time Israel was at war was Yom Kippur, which is in 1973. And Yom Kippur means Day of Atonement. It's the holiest day of the Jewish year. October 7th of this year was 50 years plus one day from Yom Kippur War. Is that an, a, 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 just a, a coincidence? No, I don't believe so. As I said last week, God loves both sides of any conflict. Would you agree to that? That means if you came in here in conflict with anybody, tell them God loves you too. We'll work it out. But no, especially here, God loves both sides. See, they need Jesus. Both sides of wherever the, uh, that's going on, especially in, in the Holy Land, only 2% of the Jews and only 2% of the Palestinians are considered Christians. And really, until Jesus, the, the Christ, it becomes the Lord of both sides, there can't really be a reconciliation, there really can't be real peace. Somebody asked me, it was, I was talking, he said, why is Hamas blocking people from traveling to the southern part of the nation? Doesn't make any sense. Uh, why are they encouraging them to remain uh, and be, maybe become martyrs? Well, I can tell you that in the, in the culture of Islam, martyrs are thought to be <coughs> rewarded by going straight to heaven. See, in Islam, uh, it's a works theology. You know, you kind of try to offset a, a lot of good things so you can offset the bad things. And so a martyr is rewarded. You say, what's a martyr? It's anyone that, one, one of their definitions was persecuted for their faith or, uh, st st or anybody that is against, uh, against their faith. So that what happens is when that is uh, identified, there's a concept of jihad. You've probably heard that or shahada in, in Islam. These are important. Jihad means an effort, a, a struggle. Sometimes it's referring, it's been referred to as the sixth pillar of Islam. And I'm, I'm flying a lot of detail here. And you're just getting the mountain peak of what I, you know, I mean, if you want to talk more, buy me a cup of coffee, we'll talk. Okay. The greater jihad, jihad has various levels. The first one is the struggle, the inner struggle, okay, of, of a believer of Islam of, with their ego or evil tendencies. Okay, we could identify with that. The lesser jihad, they say, is the struggle or fight against the enemies of Islam. But the way the enemy loves to pervert things, he reprioritizes things and removes the things that are as much inner and makes it all about someone else. Do you, do you see the, the, the counterfeiting that's going on? So they might say a, a person soiled by sin could take, undertake jihad and, and get their spirit purified. They, they can go to battle and get, get their sins forgiven. Uh, and, and if you hear, hear them shouting, uh, shahada, it's the Muslim profession of faith. It means there's no one worthy of worship but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And you say, Pastor, you're really pointing out a people. No, I want to point out a spirit. I want to point out the real battle that is going on, okay, that does use people to fulfill its game plan. So I want to talk about the spirit of Hamas. That spirit of Hamas started back in the days of Noah. Hamas is an Arabic acronym that we would see in the news, uh, Islamic Resistance Movement. It, but, but the Arabic word itself means zeal. And if you take the Hebrew word and look in the Bible, the Hebrew uh, word for this is violent evil. The, the word appears, Hamas, appears in Genesis chapter 6, verse 11. It says, now the God saw the earth had become corrupt and filled with Hamas, violent evil. The whole world possessed this spirit, the spirit of violence, motivated, the same spirit that would attack the Abraham covenant as we see it and trying to change it. It's been at work. In fact, Hamas, the word is referred to the Chaldeans in Habakkuk 1, the Babylonians in Jeremiah 31, the, the Shemites, which is from Shem, Noah's one of his sons, Judges chapter 9, the Egyptians in Joel chapter 3, it goes on and on. Google the word that is related to Hamas, you'll find it throughout the Bible. The point is, people, tribes, nations come and go, but the demonic realm remains the same until Jesus returns. There will be victory in, in places and times through believers this side of this, the, the, the reestablishing of the second kingdom, but we won't have total victory until Jesus comes back again and establishes his rule and reign. So this 
spirit of Hamas, we've seen it working through nations. This isn't just about an Islam thing. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? Nations, governments, peoples that want to possess the land, in, uh, change the lineage, destruct the plan of the Lord. It's, uh, it's demonic. It's powerful. Hamas means powerful spirit or powerful warrior spirit. And so when you see it celebrated globally, church, that's warfare. There are many people who are uninformed, ignorant. I, I don't mean that intellectually. I'm just talking about it, uninformed. And they're, they're standing in places just because friends or family or tradition has had it such. Get in the word of God. Ask the Lord for a spiritual revelation into your heart of what's truth. Wait against what you're hearing. See, I believe the battle that started in Abraham's home is the battle in Abraham's homeland today. I think it's the same one. Again, hear me say it, and I'm going to say it twice. The Palestinian people are not evil. Did you hear me? Just try to say it one more time. The Palestinian people are not evil. The Americans are not evil. Israelites are not, I mean, evil as in, but there is a war that's raging that utilizes the uninformed and the unaware and people who don't have the right identity and position in Christ. Yeah. It's happening. So, wow, pastor, I'm so encouraged. <laughs> that really helped me out. What's the future? It's interesting. They've been asking that for a long time. In fact, Jesus' his disciples came and asked him about this because Jesus was talking about And he says, as Jesus said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the ending of the age? And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray. May I say there will be imams, there will be pastors, there will be rabbis. We've got to be careful. There'll be people that have other religions that say, oh, I've got the answer. Be careful not to be led astray. Verse 5, for many will come in my name saying I am the Christ and they will lead many astray and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars and here on why I put it in yellow, see that you're not alarmed. <gasps> oh, it's terrible what's going on. But believers in Jesus Christ, if you, uh, you, we, we've got to realize this is a call for us, the church, to, uh, to take an action. I'm going to come to that in a minute. But look here. For this must take place, but the end will not follow immediately. So everything's going to get crazy, and then there's going to be more. <laughs> Real positive here. For nation will rise against nation and king against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. But all of this is only birth pains. Most people that have ever had real birth pains don't want to do it for, you know, generations. They like to do it in a few hours, if possible, or under the help of an epidural or something. Anyway, I'm not an expert at that, by the way. I'm not a mom. But then he says, comma, with more to come. Do you, do you see? I think too many people think that we're going to get it all before Jesus gets here. We're going to have all this Disneyland and you know Mickey Mouse there and it's free food and free rides. I can tell you, you go to Disneyland, you're not full of peace. <laughs> Notice my little icon. I, <laughs> verse 9. And then you'll be arrested. Look at your name and say, again? No, yeah. You'll be arrested persecuted, killed. Aren't you just wanting to get, you sign me up. And you'll be hated all over the world because you are my followers and many will turn away from me and betray, betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people and sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news, everybody say good news. Because right about now we need some good news. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all the nations will hear it. And then the end will come. Praise the Lord, right? Amen. Jump to third, uh, verse 36 of this chapter. But concerning that day and hour, nobody knows. So many people want to try to figure it out. The only thing prophetic today I'll say is Jesus is coming back sooner today than he was yesterday. That's verifiable right now. Okay, but nobody knows. Not even the angels. 
This is Jesus talking to his disciples, nor the Son, but the Father only, for as the days of Noah, interesting, so the coming of the Son of Man. Why? For as in those days, the flood, the deluge, they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were giving in marriage, they were shopping, they were upgrading their iPhones, they were whatever you're doing, right? They were just going about their way until the day when Noah entered the ark. That funny guy, you know, that keeps going to church on Sundays. <laughs> ah, you know, we got things to do. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept all of them away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. It's an alert. There's a yellow flashing light on your dashboard, Christians. The end of time, this sudden turn is ahead of us. What are we going to do about it? How are you living life? What's our witness? What's our walk? What's our testimony? I love what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write to you, for you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. Remember what, I, I've done this before. We're here having church one Sunday morning, and let's say it's the, it's the morning Jesus has come back, and I, I, Darla starts just doing this amazing, that's it, he's back. It's not rush down to the front and get things right. He's back. And if the church service goes on and I'm still here, he'll hear, I really miss the boat. Right? However, we, wherever you draw your line, pre, I, I had a whole thing on the dispense. Anyway, we won't do that. We'll go on. It goes on in verse 3, and when people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin and there will be no escape. But, believers, and I just say this before you leave today, if you really don't have a solid footing on what you believe about Jesus Christ, if you've not truly decided he is the Savior and that he's your Savior, man, don't leave without us talking at least about it. Because when you're before Christ, you have no light. You're a great vessel to carry the light, but you're empty. And you may have success in this world. You may be brilliant. You may academically and, and in the business world done great with your uh, prowlness. But unless you have Jesus, you have no light. For those of us that have said yes to Jesus and we've received not only his forgiveness, his salvation, we've been given his Holy Spirit, the light of God. And it says, those people, dear brothers and sisters, you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. For you are all children of light and of the day, and we do not belong to darkness or night. Your identity was shifted from dark to light through the blood of Jesus Christ. You have a new identity, a new thing that can, is empowering you. You're set free from the bondage, the influence, the control of the old nature. And you've got a new one. It's beautiful and full of hope. And so it says, church, verse 6, be on guard. Be on guard, not to sleep, uh, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our what? Folks, you need a confidence right now. The sea is turbulent. You think it's going to stay on the other side of the world? You got another thing coming. We watch the news and think that's in the big cities. There will be a day, and the days are only going to get darker unless you're a child of the light, and they cannot rob the light that's within you. So when you are the light bearer, you can go into those places with confidence and hope and a clear-mindedness. But do you have the confidence of salvation today? Make sure and shore that up. It says, for God, verse 9, chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that 
Whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. And here, church, you're doing it. It's beautiful. We need to keep it up, whether it's on key bat, uh, keyboards through social media, emails, texting, whatever it is with your thumbs, whether it's in this church or in your neighborhood. It says, so encourage one another. How many needs a little encouragement every now and then? I know I do. We need to encourage one another and build each other up just as you're already doing. Because there's a... There's someone roaming around to steal your joy, to rob you, to kill you, to change your theology, to make you feel, feel full of fear, and that's not of the Lord. We've got a mighty God that overcomes all that. Amen? Amen. So I have an old hymn that came to mind, and I, I'm, I decided we'd sing it Acapulco style. Now you know you really need to oversing me. <laughs> no, it's, it's acapella, okay? If you'll stand with me, we're going to close with this song. I've held the refrain to the, to the end, uh, which is basically the chorus. But I want us to sing this. Th think about this truth. Think about where your emotion is right now. Maybe it's some stuff. I mean, my family's got a lot of stuff in front of us. But our hope is not... In our ability, our hope is not in, in our attendance to a church. Our hope is not even in the medical community. Our hope is in Jesus Christ, the plan of God. So if you'll sing with me, then i got one more piece of scripture. We're going to go out with a shout, okay? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest thing, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Verse 2. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest in his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the pale. His oath is covered. Support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and say. And number four, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand be. For thy throne out for our church. On Christ the solid rock I stand, no other ground is sinking sand, no other ground is sinking sand. Amen. 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 You all sounded great. Well, I know I always kind of try to end with a football kind of theme, you know. And some of you go, uh, no, we've got morning going. Anyway, I won't go there. I want to leave on a high note, okay? Everybody ready? And I'm just going to go to Scripture. Is that okay? All right, I'm going to read it, though, like I'm the coach, and I'm trying to get, remind us players what we're about ready to go take the field. Y'all about ready to go take the field? Do you realize you're on the winning team? I just want to make sure you realize that, okay? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will go dark and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a mighty blast of the trumpet. And they will gather as his chosen ones all over the world from the farthest ends uh, from east to west. Church, God bless you. Go out and be the church. Keep the hope. If you have questions, I'll be here after the service. You're dismissed.